Good. So let's get started here. Um, the Hospitality and Lodging uh, Club is proud to welcome Arnie Sorensen today for a conversation on the lodging industry leadership um, and just generally uh, hearing some wise words from a wise man. Um, Arnie is the president and CEO of Married International, um, as many of you likely know, uh, is one of the leading brands um, in hospitality globally. Uh, prior to his time at Marriott, he was a partner at Latham & Watkins after uh, earning an undergraduate degree from Luther College and his law degree from University of Minnesota, Go Gophers. Um, and we are happy to have uh, him here. And I'm going to stop talking now and turn it over to Professor Jeff Macker, who will moderate this conversation for us. Thank you guys for joining us. And Jeff, go right ahead. All right, great. Thanks, David. Really appreciate it. And Arnie, again, really appreciate you uh, agreeing to this. Uh, one of the benefits, if there are any, of COVID is the ability to have Zoom meetings. And we've done a lot of these, actually, and they've been very informative. I hope we continue to do it once we're past, uh, past this. Uh, most of the questions, in fact, all of the questions have been driven by the students. Uh, so what I'm going to be asking are questions that come directly from them. Uh, but the number one question that I got, that we got from the students was, you know, you and I have known each other for about 15, 20 years, and yet I'm still not on your board. When are you putting me on your board? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's. Uh, That's good. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I've been working on that. I, I've been doing this in, in February, so. <laughs> All right. We got a deal. So one, one question that the students do have is your background. Now, you do come from a, a, a liberal arts education, Luther College in Iowa, and uh, a, a liberal arts religion undergrad. Nevertheless, you do have a, a University of Minnesota Law School degree. Can you, that's a little bit different from many of the other CEOs that are leading large hotel chains. Uh, so from Hyatt to IHG to, um, others, maybe a little bit more business degree. Can you walk us through your journey as to how you got from law school, liberal arts to where you are today? Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, one step at a time is the answer. Um, and I, I think to some extent, uh, this is a reflection of both the geographic differences and, and uh, generational differences. Uh, and uh, let's start by recognizing that there is nothing like going to school and getting educated in the areas that you think will be useful to you in whatever career you want to pursue. And so for those of uh, all of you who are at Georgetown Business School, I think it's a spectacular place to be. And, and if you've decided to get into business, it is perfectly appropriate and sensible and would be, uh, you'd be crazy probably to do anything else but to go to a great business school. So, so uh, uh, good on you for that. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I, my my uh, father, both grandfathers were Lutheran preachers. All three of them went to the same college that I went to. Uh, we had uh, started our family life in Japan and didn't move back to the States until I was in uh, elementary school. And uh, for whatever set of reasons, I really didn't think about going to uh, schools outside of the, the sort of cocoon that, that defined our family heritage. Uh, I didn't apply to any school on the East Coast, for example. I applied to three schools in the Midwest, uh, and and uh, they were all uh, kind of cousin schools in a way. Uh, and I went there, uh, of course, to learn and to grow up, which is, I think, why many of us go to uh, college or university. Uh, went to law school uh, really because I didn't like the jobs that were available at the end of college. I didn't want to go be a management trainee at a uh, at, a, at a big company that uh, was a sort of a personality list to me, uh, but wanted to keep learning. Uh, and so uh, law school seemed like a, a decent place to go and have some flexibility for, for a career. I, I do think that the lesson in this is whether you've gone to Luther College or, or uh, Georgetown um, for business school, uh, you have to keep learning. Uh, and if you've gotten a finance degree because you want to be in finance, but you don't keep learning, you're not going to succeed. Sure. Uh, because you, because what you learn is not going to stay current for very long. All right. So so let me let me ask you this then. You practiced law for a pretty long time, but did you ever see yourself going into a the hotel industry? I, I know you met Bill Marriott in '93 when you were defending the chain, 
But yeah. w was this just a shift in what you wanted to accomplish or do in your career as you moved out of, you were specializing in corporate uh, mergers and acquisition litigation. What sort of pushed you into, besides obviously meeting Bill Mary, what made you think that this might be the career for you? Well, the, the idea I had when I went to law, law school was uh, a law degree could set me up to do two or three or four different things over the course of my career. Uh, practicing law was just one of those. Uh, and to the extent I thought about it, uh, at the time I left, um, I worried a little bit that I liked practicing law too much and I might end up just staying. You know, the law firm is a great law firm. Yeah. Uh, career was a good career. Had some great cases. Um, actually, Bill Marriott called uh, not during the middle of the Marriott litigation, but during the middle of the Haft family litigation and said, why don't, why don't you come out to Marriott? And I think it was the third month of a jury trial in DC Superior Court. Uh, probably your your audience here is too young to remember who the half family was, but they were suing each other for years, and it was the best and worst, I suppose, of courtroom dramas. The best in the sense that we were there every day, and the news cameras were outside the courthouse. The worst in the sense that we were accomplishing nothing other than helping a family destroy itself. No kidding! Wow. So, so you joined Marriott, but you did not join as a head of Marriott, say, mergers and acquisitions, and not as a lawyer either. You wanted, I, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but you wanted something different. Well, I, I said to Bill Marriott when he called, if you want me to be a lawyer, uh, you can call me down here at Latham and Watkins, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. Uh, I'm not interested in coming out to, to a Marriott to be an in-house lawyer. Uh, I did do the M&A beat or business development beat for two years. Uh, yeah. We bought a couple of companies. Uh, and after two years, he asked me to be the chief financial officer, which, um, you know, it, it just a sign of how arguably irresponsible it was for him to offer me that job. Uh, but when he offered it to me on a Saturday morning at his house, the idea had never crossed my mind before. <laughs> For the obvious reasons that I didn't go to business school, I wasn't a CPA, you know, I wasn't classically trained in any of that. Right. But he said, why don't you step in and uh, do that? And I did that for over a decade and, and, of course, learned a little bit about finance in that context. Gotcha. Oh, that's that's great. In uh, so transitioning from your background, and obviously you've been now, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get back to some of these questions related to your role at Marriott as well and what your plans are in the future. But in order to keep us on time, uh, let's take a little snapshot of the hotel industry. And, and obviously 2015, I think the last time I talked to you, um, you were acquiring Starwood. Uh, and at the time, there wasn't a lot of competition for that. But then Airbnb came in uh, with the on, late- on, on Bang or Airbnb? Uh, Air, I'm sorry, uh, On Bang. I, I apologize. Uh, did that impact your strategy at all? Did, did, did you feel you needed to make the purchase and beat and, and make sure that you got Starwood versus Onbang? So I can't believe it's been five years already. Since I know, we, it's amazing, right? We did that, uh, that You're last still as year. handsome as you were five yeah, years ago. Yeah, and you haven't aged a bit. So <laughs> that's, that's, all, that's all good. The, um, you know, the Onbang uh, piece of Starwood was interesting. Let me maybe back up for a step for those who aren't familiar with it. But uh, Starwood was one of our principal competitors uh, in the industry. And in early 15, I guess it would have been, uh, they uh, fired their CEO and they commenced a strategic review process. In other words, they put themselves up for sale. Uh, and, uh, you know, pe people will occasionally uh, often ask, why would you buy Starwood? And one of the answers, which is a little bit tongue in cheek, but only a little bit, is they were available for sale. Uh, and, and how often do you really get a yeah. meaningful competitor that has deliberately put themselves up for sale? Almost never. Uh, and so you've got to look really hard and say, what are the opportunities that I can achieve if, if we have this business as part of our platform? Uh, we can come back to that if it's, if, if it's of any interest. And so we, we ultimately jumped in, uh, made an offer to buy. It was an ideal time because the other potential strategic uh, buyers are other competitors in the industry for one reason or another, were not situated to be uh, a very good buyer. Um, one company was too small, another was uh, still private and was about to list and, and therefore didn't have the kind of currency that they needed. Uh, and so we were kind of the lone buyer uh, and uh, we stepped in, we thought we got a, a very good deal. 
uh, a Chinese insurance company, Anbang, uh, mm -hmm. uh, jumped in and made a proposal at the last minute, which was higher than ours. Uh, and uh, of course, I, I, when the bid came in, I thought for sure that we had lost the deal. Um, and, and I'm not sure this has changed that much in the last five years, but imagine uh, uh, bidding against, in effect, China Inc., yeah. right? Uh, yeah. they, they can spend whatever amount of money whatever they want. Uh, and to get a global platform in the lodging space, including a strong distribution in the United States and other parts of the world, we could see the attractiveness of that. So uh, the first debate was, do we make another offer uh, and try and get it back? Uh, or do we, you know, take our breakup fee and, and go off in a different direction? And, and I sort of pulled the team um, and, uh, you know, asked, asked, sort of pleaded for their unvarnished advice. Uh, have we fallen in love with our own deal? Right. Something we should pursue. And we ultimately decided, let's make a proposal that uh, we would feel good about closing. Uh, but let's not chase it beyond that. And actually, for a, a mix of reasons, and very much to our surprise, we ended up succeeding. Great. Well, from an outsider's perspective, if uh, one ha is a corporate M&A lawyer, one wants to do M&A. So I would imagine the board might have had some differing opinions on whether you should continue to pursue this. Was that the case? Or did everyone sort of fall into line eventually as long as you set the terms of when you pull away, the, the go, no go decision? I think, and, I think the board had the same question that I posed to our team, which is, have we fallen in love with the deal? Are, are we really pursuing a deal on terms that make economic sense for us, as well as, of course, strategic sense? Uh, by the time it ultimately got to making that proposal and they saw what that proposal is, they were unanimous in support of it. In supporting it. So let's talk post-acquisition of, of Starwood. Um, after that, um, you have Marriott, Starwood, and Ritz. You announced the loyalty programs are going to be consolidated into, the, into Bonvoy, which I, I love. I, I actually think Bonvoy is just a great brand. How hard was that? How hard was it uh, in consolidating everything into the Bonvoy loyalty program? It took um, a year and a half um, of solid work by you know hundreds of people, uh, and and the the principal pieces of that were a technology platform that had to be uh, capable of of merging these two things, uh, a set of rules that had to win over the loyalty of the SPG, the prior Starwood yeah. programs uh, loyalists. Uh, and then, of course, branding and naming of the new combined program. Were the, and, were the S were the SPG loyalists one of the more difficult? Oh, ones? absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we we started uh, uh, trying to appeal to them before we closed the transaction. Uh, when the transaction was pending, yeah. uh, we you know I, I won't remember exactly the details of what we did, but we basically came out and said, on the day we closed the transaction. Uh, we will recognize your elite status if you have it on one side in the other, the other. Yeah. Uh, and we will allow you to transfer points between the two programs. Uh, yeah. and do that on the day of closing. Initially, all the folks told me it was impossible to get done, uh, but it was a way of essentially uh, saying there is immediate good news for you, whether you're a Marriott Rewards member or an SPG member, and there's more good news coming down the pike. Okay, so one of the questions that this one of the students had around that, now that the Marriott branding continues to be built around Bonvoy, and for instance, just this week, I received two emails regarding Bonvoy, even though I am a member, and asking me to double down on credit cards. Given that the loyalty program is such a strong value proposition for you guys, have you ever thought about renaming Marriott Bonvoy to go all in on that value proposition? So in the in it's a really good question, and, and I think it can be asked that way, or it could be asked um, the way we asked it internally. So when we were we were renaming a combined loyalty program, previously Marriott Rewards and, and yep. SPG, which historically was Starwood Preferred Guest, but really known as SPG, the Starwood name did not exist on any single hotel brand, uh, right. not nearly as old a, a old name as Marriott, obviously. Uh, but we had some folks who who loved the the uh, sort of independence and and newness of the loyalty program and said why why shouldn't why shouldn't we jettison the Marriott name? Uh, and uh, my answer uh, and and obviously ultimately prevailed was 
Merit name is extraordinarily well known. Great. And, and why would you give up uh, the familiarity of that uh, name or something which is a uh, new word, maybe sure. word, right? It feels like Bon Voyage, so it probably <laughs> it probably works pretty well. I mean, we thought about that, but yeah. Uh, the and I think it, the answer to the question is the same today. The Marriott name is extraordinarily well known. It's filled with mostly good attributes uh, from a customer perspective. So sure. not something we need to run from. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, I suspect it's something we'll hang on to. Yeah, I would, I would be shocked if uh, you would have said something different than what you did, um, <laughs> just looking at it from that perspective. Uh, your revenue stream is largely built on management contracts with the property owners, and obviously the owners can decline the Marriott flag on the property and list with OTAs, these online travel agents like Booking.com and Expedia. Now, in this context, do you see OTAs as a bigger threat than some of the traditional incumbents that you face, the Hiltons or the Hyatts? And would you ever consider delisting from OTAs? Well, let's see, there are a couple of good questions in that. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, are, do we fear the OTAs as, as uh, bigger threats than our lodging competitors? And I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, the, the somewhat longer answer is not just the Expedias and bookings of the world, but the Googles of the world. Um, the, the tech platforms, uh, know an extraordinary amount about all of us. Uh, they, um, in Google's context, they know every place we search online. They know everything we look at. In Amazon's context, they know everything we buy. They know our preferences. They can often know them better than we know them ourselves. Uh, and uh, their business model fundamentally is to get uh, in the middle between the supplier and the yep. customer and extract a tax. Right, might yep. be as a percentage of sales. It might be an ad ad click. It might be a, a commission structure. There are lots of yep. different structures, but they're trying to extract a tax. And uh, obviously, we don't want to pay that tax more than necessary, and we only want to pay it when it's bringing incremental business to us. Sure. And so, the the principal reason we went after Starwood was to say we need a bigger ecosystem so that. Uh, our loyalty members can live within our ecosystem and not feel like they've got to go to right. Expedia or to Google uh, and, right. and find and, a place that they want to travel. And, and I think you guys were very, you pushed the direct bookings um, from 2015 to today, much more so than I, I would argue anyone. So I'm sort of your ideal customer. I only go to the Marriott.com website when I want to book. And unfortunately, my wife goes to Expedia.com. So yeah. she's a She's a problem for you, but I, I, I know I'm going to stay in a Marriott hotel anyway because I want the loyalty program. So I, I have no interest but searching um, Marriott simply because I know the price that you're going to charge will be at or equal to anything I'll find anywhere else. That's right. And, and so, so I'm your, your ideal, and I know you have a loyal customer following, and obviously what you just said, having that great that footprint now just makes me a more loyal customer. The trouble is these non-infrequent leisure customers are where you're, you're most likely losing a lot, some business, at least some business, yeah, Ooh, forgetting right. COVID. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's, that's where the OTAs and Marriott are most aligned, right? Because yeah. if, if they can deliver us the occasional leisure customer who doesn't really have loyalty because it's right. not really in their interest to be in a loyal program, right? And, and as a consequence, they're gonna be uh, less inclined to come to us directly, that's fine. But when they yep. start to, to say, all right, we're gonna pivot our model and get uh, everybody, right? Including right. the warrior, that's where it gets expensive for us. And so yeah. we've done things in the last few years to basically say, it's always been the case, you can't get loyalty points directly with us. If you book yep. a media, you're not getting any. But not only are we going to make sure you can't get the, the uh, room rate lower someplace else, but we're actually going to give it to you lower on our lower. side. Right. And has the, obviously that's been effective. Have other re hotel chains matched your approach? By and large, all of them have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, I would have uh, figured. All right, uh, one last question on the hotel industry before we transition. Airbnb filed for their anticipated IPO. What impact will you uh, will will this have in general on the on the travel industry? 
how do you think the institutional hotel companies, including you, will react uh, from both a market and a non-market perspective? So think home rental brands, positioning, rewards programs on the market side, and then on the non-market side, lobbying, the use of social media or influencing. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Airbnb, I think, is going to price tomorrow. At least that's what the news is of this morning said. Uh, and we'll immediately have a another public company in our industry broadly defined, uh, maybe with a value bigger than ours, yeah. uh, will be very close in any, in, in it. I wouldn't surprise me if it had a bigger value. Um, and uh, I think the fact that they're public is not terribly revolutionary. It'd be, yeah. ni it'd be nice to have, have more information about, about them and about their profitability. Interesting to us, we of course have combed through their, their offering documents. Uh, their their uh, system wide sales are less than half of ours. So by system wide sales, that yep. is the gross amount paid by all of the guests staying at Airbnb facilities, compared to the gross amount paid by all of our hotel guests. We're at about close to ninety billion, I think, in 2019. We think they were at 37 billion or something like that. Uh, and and so so we'll, we'll end up doing a lot of that. We'll torture ourselves and sort of yeah. make some comparisons. I think the more interesting thing is that they have opened up a new space, which is uh, how do you get particularly the whole home rental, uh, right. in a, which has existed, you know, for a long, long time, but how do you get it done in a uh, digital world uh, that allows a loyalty overlay, that allows a uh, ease of booking, uh, right. And uh, they they have taken some steps on that, but we've gotten into it too. You know, yeah. we've got homes and villas by Marriott, and, so, and so people will go after this. You you say you know they're only half of your size. I still think that's thirty seven billion is a pretty big number. I, I, that's yeah. a pretty yeah. big company. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and I, I last question. Well, actually, two more here. Would you ever envision a scenario where Marriott lists on Airbnb? No, no, no. Okay. Um, and and I can't imagine uh, listing hotels on Hilton either. Yeah, sure. But I think Airbnb is this kind of intermediary, a little bit different in terms of you know matching properties to demand in a way that Hilton would be different. But it's a question that was raised, and I I thought it was an interesting question there. Yeah. All right, last last question, uh, U.S. question in particular. The real estate club that David London is part of and helped arrange, I brought in two of my friends from Starwood. Uh, Jeff Dishner, who I think you know, the senior managing director works under Barry, uh, and um, Jeff DeModica, who runs um, another part of the Starwood business. Both of them were consistent in what they see, the, how the U.S. markets are transitioning away from the large urban environments of the New Yorks, the San Francisco's, the LA's, uh, and um, the Boston's toward, in, in real estate in general, where people want to live. Places like the West, um, the mountain states, where there's favorable tax uh, taxes at the state level, or desirable places to live because there's a lot of business that's been there. Are you guys looking at changes that are occurring in the U.S. in terms of demographic population shifts or employment shifts that are currently occurring, either because of COVID or for other reasons? And, and yeah. how are you guys planning that? I mean, I think I think that the, the COVID impact is still obviously very new. Uh, and it'll uh, be interesting to see how that uh, lasts and evolves when the virus starts to recede. Uh, clearly, you look at residential real estate and you see residential real estate in non-urban markets. Right moving uh, much more healthily and, and faster. Uh, and uh, that's for obvious reasons. You look at where people uh, vacation this summer, for example, right. not cities by and large, but, but uh, coastal destinations, mountain destinations, resort destinations, uh, and uh, all of that is reasonably obvious why. Uh, uh, you can drive to those places. Uh, you don't need to go into virus hotspots. You're not dependent on mass transit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Be beyond the fact that why would you go to New York? The shows are all closed. You know, right. The restaurants are closed, et cetera. Um, and, and of course, then you compound this with the fact that nobody's going to work and, and we may, uh, nobody's going to the office is what I should right. say. Uh, and uh, you know how Washington is. You go down to Washington in the weekday afternoon and it's dead zone. Uh, and 
Uh, the hotels are, are quiet, but the small businesses are closed and the offices are closed. What happens a year from now? Uh, I think we'll actually shift substantially back towards where we were before. Uh, not all the way. I think remote work will be a more regular part of office workers' lives uh, than it was before. Maybe that's a couple of days a week. But I think most companies will still value, most institutions will still value people coming in, building culture, collaborating, doing all sorts of other things. I think, um, you know, we could pull this group, I suppose. I don't know how to do it technologically, but the, um, uh, I think cities are still going to be very attractive places for people to live and start their careers and probably build their careers. Uh, and we'll end up with uh, the cities getting certainly more vibrant than they are today. Yeah. It'll take them a while to get back to where they were before. Yeah. So I, I've heard, um, you know, in this, it, conditions of up to five years before we're back to where we once were, uh, and, and in, in particular in the travel industry for both airlines and hotels. But you seem a little bit more optimistic there in largely a return uh, in, you're saying, in about a year. Oh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I think the, uh, and obviously a lot of this is about the virus, which I'm not an expert on, but uh, the, the uh, bad news, of course, is the virus numbers today are awful. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, the next number of months are likely to be pretty lousy from a business perspective, whether it's our business or lots of other businesses. Uh, but the good news is the vaccine. Uh, yeah. And uh, by, by mid-year next year, uh, it seems reasonably probable that folks who want a vaccine will have been able to get a vaccine. Uh, and as a consequence, I think in 2021, we will see a step change back up. Not to 2019 levels, though. I think to get back to 2019 levels is probably a good two or three years out. Yeah, I think you're right there. So one of the questions that uh, one of the persons that we had in from Starwood was commenting on and is how successful their extended stay hotels were doing. Uh, are you seeing the same kind of thing with Marriott? And has that shifted your decisions in any way to build out your homes and villas brand as travelers shift to these uh, more longer stay, low touch travel uh, options? Yeah, well, uh, you know, we've got uh, uh, Residence Inn and uh, Element, which was one of the Starwood's brand, Starwood brands and Town Place Suites, all classically extended stay yep. hotel brands. Uh, Residence Inn brand by itself has been probably the single most profitable really? real estate investment in the hotel industry globally for decades, hmm. decades. Uh, and, and part of that is because with an extended stay, your operating costs are lighter. Yeah. Uh, part of that is you tend to run higher occupancy uh, and you end up with a um, customer group, which is a little less dependent on what, whatever's happening with GDP at the moment, right? Because there are folks who are on longer term assignments or they're uh, in sort of less than permanent moves on a personal basis, a uh, number of different factors that are going into that. I think the pandemic has reminded us of the strength of those uh, kinds of brands. Uh, yeah. They are drive to, they, they include folks yep. that are just travelers, but are, you know, kind of in a, in a between and betwixt place. Uh, Starwood Capital, of course, owns a whole bunch of our uh, properties in this space, not yep. and, and some of our competitors. But so I think that that is not surprising to me at all. That's different though from Airbnb and whole home. Uh, I think that whole home context can play a role for a true extended stay. Yeah. But it's also about, in a pandemic, that is about controlling 100% of where you're staying, right? Yeah, good I point. I can be certain nobody else is going to be in that house that I rent. Right. All right. We have, uh, I, I guess, about nine minutes before we need to transition. So there's two other large categories that they wanted me to hit, and then a lightning round, which I definitely want to get to. Uh, as I mentioned before we get on, I teach a course on strategies beyond the market, this idea of how a firm needs to consider both the public politics side of its business, uh, working with regulators, working with um, Congress, as well as the private politics side of it. And recently, there's been an uptick in both corporate activism, uh, corporations taking it upon themselves to root out issues that have an environmental, social, or governance concern, as well as CEOs speaking more publicly. And, and there's a whole host of CEOs from Salesforce to Bank of America uh, to even companies like Chick-fil-A um, potentially saying things that are a little bit more controversial. 
how do you see Marriott's, what's your thoughts and Marriott's position on when to speak up on topics that are either within your core business or outside of your core business? Yeah. Well, it, you know, not every company is the same. Uh, we have about 750,000 people that wear our name badge every day around the globe or, or did before the pandemic hit. Uh, and in an environment in which there's less, less trust in institutions, including government, I think more and more people look to their uh, places of work, to their employers uh, for uh, what? For advocacy, uh, for um, interpretation of the world that they live in. Uh, and so there's a demand from our community that we speak out on the things which are germane to us, right? So. Um, I think that excludes things. Uh, for example, I've spoken out on many, many things, never on, never on choice issues. Why? Not because I don't have a personal point of view, but who cares what my point of view is on it, right? It doesn't have anything to do with the hotel business yeah. uh, and who we're accepting in as guests to our hotels. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, uh, inclusiveness is very much uh, uh, in, integrated with our business travel policy, um, um, you know, there, there are lots of places where uh, for our community of associates and for our guests, it is germane to our business and it would be as risky for us not to speak out as to speak out. So do you think the repercussions of you not speaking out indicates uh, implicitly that you might support a view that Marriott never did or you certainly never would? So for instance, you know, Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, <laughs> Marriott has, in your view, obviously support that from both your employee perspective and your associate's perspective, but by staling, say, remaining silent means you're complicit? Uh, I th well, yeah, I mean, take the George Floyd killing uh, earlier this year. Um, I, I immediately blogged about it in part because that's sort of one of the things I do and I was thinking about it and I was troubled by it and, and wanted to sort of share my point of view. But I think we would have gotten beat up, uh, fairly beat up, if we had not uh, spoken out about that event. Yeah, and, and what, it's said, a, what, are you, what are you telling us, that this is okay? And it's, a, it's an interesting transition because think about your role versus the two previous CEOs. Uh, you had Jay Willard for 45 years and uh, Bill Marriott for 40 years. I don't know if they would have spoken out on some of these issues the way today's CEO is almost required to. It's a, it's a recent and interesting phenomenon that I think a lot of CEOs have to deal with. It's just sort of another task or another requirement for the job. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, and, and this is more, more arcane business perspective, but you got a business audience here. The, the um, Bill Marriott, uh, I've now been CEO for eight years. So he was uh, CEO, as you mentioned, for 40 until 2012. Uh, never did quarterly earnings calls. Not only did he not speak out on, on social issues, but he, he didn't speak out on things that business. affect the business. <laughs> uh, and and um, uh, I, he, he's done one, and that was after 9-11 when I, I was CFO and I invited him to come in and said, I think uh, in the environment of uncertainty that we've got, it would be useful to hear your voice of, uh, you know, we'll get through this, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the way times change. I mean, his, his job would have been principally internal and then marketing to hotel guests. It would right. not have been about the financial community. It would not have been about policy issues. Uh, it wouldn't have been about any of those things. Yeah, and to me, it's just, I think an interesting and recent phenomenon that that's uh, amazing. Now, you mentioned you've been CEO for eight years. By my calculations, you're going to have to be CEO for 36 and a half more years in order to meet the average <laughs> of the two prior CEOs. Do you got it in you? Uh, no, I don't think so, no. <laughs> then how do you begin to plan a transition? Um, you know, obviously, we don't want Arnie Sorensen hit by a bus, but how do you, how do you begin to cultivate the leader's that will take over for you when you're when you either retire or you know step down. Well, the succession, succession conversation has got to be a regular conversation. In fact, the, the uh, first board meeting I came to after becoming CEO, uh, I said we got to talk about succession, 
and there were, there were you know a good percentage of the board that looked at me like what are you what are you talking about you're brand new in the position and I, I proverbial bus uh, being hit by the bus is the example you know you, you don't know whether I'll be hit by a bus you also also don't know whether I'm going to fail I'm a right. new CEO stepping in uh, behind an icon in the industry uh, and you've got to be ready uh, to replace me and so. Um, I want to make sure that that is part, it's something we talk about every quarter, and it means that uh, it is reverberating back into what we do in the management ranks, which is to identify uh, ready now candidates, identify candidates we think might be ready in five years or 10 years, uh, and make sure that we are being deliberate about building their breadth, uh, uh, making yep. them as known candidates as they possibly can be. Uh, and uh, having, a, having a set of choices. For the yeah. So a good friend of mine is pretty high up at B of A and, and uh, what they do is a rotational system where you assume, you know, for, you assume capital markets, you, you do a rotation for the commercial side of the bank. You guys have the same kind of, of approach where these high, these targeted individuals are rotating among the businesses in order to gain the experience that they might need in order to become the next CEO. It's probably less formal than a, an institution of the size of B and A. a, B of a. Yeah. Obviously, they're they're meaningfully bigger than we are. But with respect to each person on that succession list, we are saying, okay, where do they need to be broadened? How does that compare to what the importance of what they're doing today? Gotcha. Uh, when do we move them? Uh, are there ways to modify the job that they have today so that we can add some things or or take some things take some things away? And, yeah. Okay. Build but you've got to be very specific. Great. Okay, we're right at uh, almost on time, about a minute uh, off. Off. But let me uh, move into the lightning round. So, sixty seconds on the clock. What's your favorite holiday tradition? Uh, anything being with family. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, we've got four kids, and and they are my uh, rock, and and so being with family is it. By the way, Austri deferred. Is she going to become part of the McDonough School of Business MBA class next year? Oh, I sure hope so. Yeah. So those of you that are listening to the call, Ostri, uh, your oldest. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I uh, will hopefully become uh, part of the full-time or evening program MBA. She was accepted to both and she's uh, outstanding in every way. What book are you uh, currently reading? Uh, right now, Killer Angels. Killer uh, Angels. I'm going to write is, that down. It is a novel set in the Civil War at the Battle of Gettysburg. And even though it's a novel, it's one of the best uh, it's historical uh, portraits of the Civil War. Excellent. If, uh, if you could have dinner with one person, it can't be Mark London, uh, who would it be? Probably Martin Luther King uh, Jr. I, I think the, um, you know, I, I think at times about Nelson Mandela or about Gandhi or about Jesus. Uh, there are a few folks who individually have had enormous impact on the world. Uh, I think MLK obviously has had that impact, but I also think he would uh, be a great conversationalist uh, and uh, be very interesting, particularly from today's vantage point. To yeah, and that, that was going to be my next question. Would you want to meet him during his day or have him come to your day? And, and yeah, a little bit of both, I think. A little bit of both. You'd, you'd, like, you'd like him at his peak, uh, which is obviously when he was with us. Uh, but it would be sure be nice to get his reflections on the on the world today. On the world today, yeah, I, I think that would be interesting. Uh, this one I'm not sure you can answer. What's your favorite brand in the Marriott portfolio? Nice try. It's my favorite kid. You're not mm -hmm. going to get an answer on that one. Yeah, well, mine's mine mine is Lars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which one? Which one? Which is what is one brand you admire outside the Marriott portfolio? Well, this, this is maybe just uh, partly to, to uh, give something that uh, you all probably study, but I think uh, from a business perspective, Peloton is fascinating. Uh, to, uh, to launch a brand at a dramatically higher price point for a product that's already well-established and to knock the lights out, yeah. uh, you got to give them credit for it. So there, I'm going to uh, say, suggest one plus one equals three in their case. More bikes sell more people um, buying into the software, and a lot, which sells more bikes. It's, it's a really nice sort of system that they've set up. And it's a, symbi a system that's symbiotic. You, you sell more hardware, you sell more software, you sell more, more subscriptions, you sell more hardware, you sell more software. So they've figured it out. And it's an interesting um, uh, per perspective. Uh, 
Foam or feather pillows? Feather. Low floor or high floor? Um, yeah, it varies. Uh, high floor, I suppose. Depends on the dis depends on the destination. Guilty pleasure. Well, I'll probably ruin my reputation with this, uh, but I'll put it in context. I, I only play it maybe two or three rounds of golf a year, uh, but and often there with your neighbor, Mark London. Um, uh, I do enjoy a cigar on the golf course. Nice, nice. Uh, I uh, Just a little tidbit. It was mentioned in, uh, Arnie mentioned that he was actually born in Tokyo. My understanding is when you are sick, you still eat sushi to make yourself feel good the way in the US we might eat chicken noodle soup. Japanese food is my comfort food without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, last one, coolest place you've ever been on a run? Uh, that's, a, that's a big list too. The, the, um, partly this is because I was young and fast, but I spent the summer of 1979 in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, wow. which was in the middle of a war. And uh, I was 21 years old, 20, I guess, technically. Uh, and we went down to uh, AUB, American University in Beirut, which is right on the Mediterranean, beautiful spot. And uh, I ran there barefoot uh, and uh, was running so fast uh, and felt so good. And it was stunningly beautiful, but also in a very interesting, provocative place and time, which is a conflict zone uh, and a war that in some respects has never ended. Sure. Sure. All right. I'm going to pause here and ask uh, David London. David, am I directing questions uh, through the q and I believe that uh, David and I are going to chime in with some questions that okay. came in from the Q&A. We'll kind of tag team that. All right. So we're about three minutes um, beyond. So why don't you guys begin to ask some of those questions? Yeah, no That's problem. And Arnie, okay. these are questions that have come in live from the chats from about the 80 or so participants we have on right now. The first one is, uh, we'll bounce a little bit between personal and business related. So one is, what is a routine that you developed early on in your career or a habit that you developed early in your career that you would recommend uh, you know, students in our position adopt? Well, I, I think, um, go back to law, law practice maybe for a minute. Uh, I read every weekly and monthly law publication. I shouldn't say every one, but I, you know, there, were, there were two or three or four that were sort of industry rags, if you will, and they would be about the, the meaningful cases decided or what was happening in the law firms or what was happening in various aspects of the profession. And I read them cover to cover. Uh, and there wasn't really any assignment to, but uh, and I'm not sure how deliberate I was about it, but the, 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 the point is you've got to suck up every information, every bit of information you possibly can about the industry or the company or the discipline that you're working in uh, and take in those inputs and, and bring that curiosity to uh, the work that you're doing. And, and find, you know, it, later on in my career, I found uh, different ways to, to uh, sort of structurally integrate that curiosity, but keep your ears open and just suck in every bit of information you can. Next one. Yep. So our next question is uh, about the business. The pandemic has accelerated certain trends that we have already seen taking shape. Uh, for example, you mentioned changing customer demographics, less business travel right now, more leisure travel. We're seeing the hospitality market in China recover a little bit faster than the rest of the world. So what trends are you seeing now that you think are going to stick and reshape to some extent the way Marriott's business operates long term? Well, Sam, is, you're right to talk about uh, the pandemic accelerating some trends. And one of the trends we've seen over the last 20 years is a shift of more and more of our total business towards leisure. Uh, and uh, away from business travel or away from the meetings business. Now it's been it's been modest. It's the shift of uh, three or four or five points, something like that. Uh, at the moment, we've seen that uh, dramatically accelerate. It'll shift back a bit, but I suspect leisure will continue to grow faster than other segments of business. And that will mean something for the way we market to folks. It'll mean something for the way we structure the loyalty program. It'll mean something for the services we offer at a hotel. 
I think the second thing I would uh, point out, it's kind of a small thing in some respects, but uh, digital key, the, the ability to open your guest room door with your phone mm. has existed for some period of time, but has really not been used by the bulk of our customers, Re really a very small percentage. And con compare that and contrast that with the airline space where certainly for domestic travel, almost none of us would print out a boarding pass anymore. Uh, and uh, we, we all know that we've got a problem if we end up at the check-in counter at an airport. That's the last thing in the world you want. And so I think the safety ramifications will drive more people to use this kind of technology. And I think it will last longer and, and be adopted much more dramatically. Great, I'll chime in here. Um, Arnie, one of the, uh, the questions coming in kind of goes back to uh, the leadership team and talking about the Starwood counter offer and how you're begging for that team to provide their you know, unvarnished opinions. As a leader, how do you encourage that construction di uh, disagreement and feedback among your leadership team? Well, you've got to, you've got to make sure it happens enough so people can see that it's safe. Uh, it's safe to give you their, um, uh, unvarnished opinion. Uh, and to some extent, that could go so far as to say it's not safe to hold back your unvarnished opinion. Uh, when I, I probably shouldn't uh, actually talk about which job, but I stepped into one job uh, and uh, compared the crew to a, a group of, of, of abused children uh, because the boss before me had uh, basically uh, not permitted this kind of dialogue. Uh, and it took a full year uh, to convince that team that it was safe and expected uh, to be able to, to say, okay, this is what I really think. This is what's not going well, or this is what uh, I think we should do differently in the future than, than what we've done in the past. But over, over the course of a year with very deliberate work, uh, no, what do you think? Tell me what you think. Uh, and particularly when those thoughts are different than your own or are new, your response to them will tell them everything, uh, whether they're uh, thoughts that should be shared or, or should be held. Uh, and I think in a big company, particularly, you have got to find a way to encourage people to give you what they think. Okay, right, now kind of getting into the, the weeds, going back to the, the Google part of the conversation. Um, do you think Google will take steps uh, in the travel industry as a reaction to threats from like an Amazon or Facebook? And um, as a follow up to that, do you see a company like Amazon or Facebook trying to get into the hospitality industry? You know, they're, they're not hospitality companies at all, but they're giants in this tech world and, and could find a way to break through. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the uh, uh, Google obviously uh, gets an enormous amount of money for uh, advertising travel related uh, uh, links or at, or ads, um, you know, Expedia and booking uh, uh, their largest expense item is uh, to Google uh, multi billions of dollars a year for advertising. We spend uh, dramatically less than that because we've got a brand that actually uh, is is known. Um, Facebook is in the process and doing extraordinarily well in monetizing their traffic as well by providing ads and providing targeted ads, you know, uh, using the information they have about their uh, uh, customers to, to uh, target to them. And, and they are uh, doing things in the travel space and they'll keep trying. Uh, Amazon, I think will be interesting. Amazon so far has not tried to be a seller of hotel rooms. Uh, but I don't know why we would be surprised if they did. Uh, they again, they're they're selling selling us everything else, uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they went at it went at it at some point in time. I'm, I'll, I'll go. I'll make a commercial here for a second, uh, and and maybe maybe this is relevant uh, to, to business group too. But you know, as you know, David, the loyalty program. The way it works, every time a loyalty member stays at a hotel on a, a paid stay, that hotel gives a percentage of the gross revenues of that stay to the loyalty program to pay for the cost of redemption of those points for a free stay at some point in time in the future. Uh, and the value of those uh, revenues, as well as what's being contributed from credit cards and others, is something like six to seven percent of the total stay. And so if you say, all right, I'm Google now. 
uh, can I put six to seven percent back into uh, value that goes directly to the customer? That's an enormously expensive proposition. And while we will always be tiny in comparison to Google, I think we do have some tools like this one in the loyalty space that can cause us to, to be able to still succeed well with customers and say, you know what, you ought to be our customer, not Google's customer. Great, and then uh, my last question um, before I kick it back to Sam for another one is you know, generally talking about corporate social responsibility and the role that a company like Marriott has in this space. Um, specifically, touching on uh, three items, I'd like to hear what Marriott is doing and, and what your viewpoints are um, when it comes to environmental response, uh, environmental sustainability, um, human trafficking concerns, and human rights and diversity and inclusion. Yeah, so all all great questions, and and um, there's a lot of work that has been underway for for many years in in some of these spaces. Um, human trafficking is probably the most recent. Uh, I think we had have trained about five or six hundred thousand of our people to spot human trafficking. Uh, we have uh, stories that have come up through the system where we have uh, been instrumental in rescuing some folks who have been uh, grabbed against their will, uh, and uh, we'll keep uh, doing everything we can. And by the way, the sharing, the training protocols and the like that we've developed, we have shared with the rest of the industry and uh, view this as not being something that is a competitive advantage, but something that's important for our industry to do. On diversity and inclusion, I think the most important thing there is creating an inclusive environment. Uh, which is both about how you run a firm, uh, how you empower people, uh, but also about uh, the way opportunities are uh, distributed, uh, whether or not I see myself in the leadership of a company or I see myself in um, uh, sort of the opportunity that the company presents to me. Um, of our top um, uh, 700, 800, let's say 800 executives of the company, 42% are women, for example. That's, we're not quite 50-50, but we're going to be 50-50. And from a gender perspective, I think we can say we see this in our board, we see this in, in uh, my direct report team. Uh, we've got uh, great, great examples of women succeeding and a great example of racial diversity succeeding as well. So, uh, But we've got to make sure that we keep keep moving on that. Sustainability, um, I think, is uh, itself worth a much longer conversation, but essentially what we want to do there is everything we can that makes economic sense. Um, and so, so uh, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do some things to experiment and, and see whether or not we can make economic sense out of it. But uh, uh, sustainable energy, uh, uh, reduced waste, uh, you know, we, we uh, made a big deal last year out of the fact that we were going to go from single use plastic toiletry bottles to uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, reused bottles that are, you know, sort of dispensers, if you will, in the, in the shower. In COVID-19, that becomes a little bit harder to, to actually roll out uh, because what the customer wants is nothing that they're touching to have been touched by somebody else. But again, all the things that we can do in our supply chain or in our operations or in uh, building management uh, that uh, uh, reduces our environmental impact, we're trying to do. Thanks. So this will be our last question before we wrap up. Uh, jumping back to the effects of the pandemic, we had a follow up on how remote work culture has affected Marriott and how you see your operations changing with your employees moving forward and also how you see the effects of remote work changing uh, the business of your guests? So I, you know, I think this, in many respects, the uh, answers to this we'll only learn together over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, uh, I don't pretend, pretend to have any particular insight to it. Uh, listening to our folks, listening to other business leaders, um, I think there is a, um, a range of views. I think many folks are uh, very frustrated now by uh, their continued digital lives. Uh, they, they, uh, while these tools are excellent for some things, 
Uh, they're not great for building cultures. They're not great for uh, collaboration and strategic conversations. Uh, they're not great for building careers, if particularly if you're early in your career. Uh, and uh, they also, they are, I think they're also not great for mental health, to tell you the truth. I, I think we, we have lost the dividing line, whatever dividing line we had before, between work and, and personal life. And now when you're doing the same thing from home every day, those lines have further blurred. So I think I, I think the world we live in today will change back significantly towards what it was before. Um, I think most uh, bosses want their teams to come back to the office. They want the jobs to exist in a physical place. I think at the same time, uh, most uh, employees want a bit more flexibility than they had before. Um, I want to be able to work a day or two a week out of the office. Uh, and not be looked at with uh, uh, cross-eyed as if I'm, you know, trying to steal an vacation day, but but that I can actually uh, be productive in that way. And you know, I, I that's sort of where I guess I I expect we'll settle out that we will mostly have jobs that uh, include offices and are in a physical place, uh, but that there will be a higher remote mix within those jobs. From a travel perspective, I think it means that uh, we can uh, uh, dial in a few days of work from uh, an incremental uh, week away. Um, so, you know, if I'm if I'm working three days in the office and two days uh, remotely, I can go down to Florida in the winter. Uh, I can work two days from Florida uh, and take only three days of vacation when uh, maybe pre-pandemic I would have had to take a week, uh, and that'll arguably have some impact. But only time will tell. Okay, I think I'm supposed to wrap it up. Is that right, Sam and, and David? Well, before I thank uh, Arnie uh, for everything, let me actually thank the two people who made this happen, Sam Goodman and, and David London. You guys did all the legwork. You did. You organized the Zoom session. You brought me the questions. You made it easier for me for that. I thank you. And I am very appreciated, appreciative uh, of it. Arnie, thank you for making time out of your schedule. I, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I'm of the ilk that in COVID times, we as educators need to do everything we can to make this environment a little bit easier for these guys. They're virtual all day, every day. And the last thing I'm sure that David London will say is hearing my voice, which he has to hear a lot, uh, bringing in people like you make it special. So thank you for continuing to contribute to Georgetown and uh, continuing uh, to do what you do. We really yeah. appreciate it. You bet. Uh, great to see you, Jeff, uh, David, and Sam. Thank you very much. Uh, all of you at Georgetown, you're in a great place. Jeff, thanks for making Georgetown such an important part of Washington and a part of the business community as well. So good to be with you all. Have a happy holiday.